Carnegie Mellon University's advanced database systems course is filmed in front of a live studio audience. Uh, let's get started. We have a lot to discuss. <clears throat> okay, so um, this class, I'm going to try to jam as much as I can in about talk about query compilation and code generation. And again, sort of like the vectorization stuff, it's another technique we can use to make our queries run faster and, and run better. Um, so in last class, we spent time talking about how we're going to use SIMD to vectorize some of the core database algorithms we have in our system uh, so that when we run sequential scans, we can achieve data parallelism where we allow the, the data system to execute the same number of instructions but operate on multiple tuples at, at the same time. Right, so again, this is data parallelism or inter-query parallelism. That's the, another way to describe this. So the paper I had you guys read today is from 2000, 2011, um, and it's a really seminal paper on, the, on, on query compilation code generation. It certainly was not the first, it wasn't, and it wasn't the, it's sort of the modern era. It wasn't the first to say, here's how to do it. Um, it is, but it, it sort of set off this, this, this investigation from multiple systems and multiple researchers on using the LLV, LL, LLVM to optimize things. So a lot of the papers in the, in the early to mid-2010s sort of give the, 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 the false impression that if you're doing vectorization, you can't do compilation. If you're doing compilation, you can't do vectorization. Um, and the, paper, the, the hyper paper you guys read, you know, they talk about, well, you don't need to do vectorization because they, they can do... They can do this push-based model and data-centric op data -centric optimizations. But we'll see at the end, like, you know, these aren't mutually exclusive, and, and you can do both. So we showed this, this slide before that, again, that since we're trying to execute sequential scans in our OLAP database system, uh, you, you know, we have to rely on making the, the, the database system actually the execution engine as fast as possible so that you know, we can get better, better results and, and make the system more efficient. All right, so we've gone through uh, a bunch of these already, right? So how to reduce instruction count, uh, reduce cycles per instruction, and then parallelize things, which, again, we'll cover more of that uh, in, in next week. But today's class, we're really going to be focusing on this first one here. Now, we care about reducing number of cycles, certainly. Um, but the compilation, the code specialization technique we're going to talk about here today is really about how to make sure that the database system does exactly what, or only executes instructions for exactly what it needs for that, for that query. Um, and the idea is almost like hard coding a program to do nothing but execute that query. Right, so we've already, and then once we've already done this, then you know, we, we, as part of doing this, we can also design uh, the, 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 the code generation components in our system to be aware of what the CPU wants and generate code for us that's going to be optimal for this. So, the reason why code compilation and, and so code specialization, query compilation is going to be important is because the because you know if, if we if we're bringing all these files from 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 disk into memory, and we assume that there's not going to be any disk stalls in uh, while we're processing queries, right? We can do asynchronous I/O. We can let something in the background go fetch the data that we need. Obviously, there's a pause in, in order to get the first thing maybe we need into memory. But while we're crunching over these large parquet and org files. Again, think of them in like you know, hundreds of megabytes, not, not you know, four kilobyte pages. But while we're, we're crunching over those files, something else in the background is going to go fetch the data we need next and bring that into memory so that when the execution engine comes around and says, OK, let me do more work, the stuff you need is already in memory. So we don't have to worry about disk stalls in this environment. Something else is going to sort of hide that, those stalls for us. Plus, as I said before, the disk and network have gotten really fast, so it's, it's less of an issue. So, there's this great paper from Microsoft in 2011 where they talk about what it would actually take to build a database system to run you know, orders of magnitude faster if you're just trying to reduce the number of instructions that you have to execute while you run, you run queries. And they make this observation that if you want your database system to run 10x faster, then you need to execute 90% fewer instructions than, than you normally would. Seems like a lot, but that's actually doable, right? Uh, it's, you know, it's not, it's not far-fetched that, we, we, that we, we could achieve this. But if you want to build a system that goes 100x faster, now you're down to really cutting the bone, because now you've got to execute 99% fewer instructions than, than what you were doing before. All right? And there isn't, you know, there isn't a flag in GCC like 0100 that's going to achieve this for us. It's going to be through careful uh, engineering and through this code specialization and compilation stuff we're talking about today is how we can actually achieve that. Right? And of course, it's, as I said, it's not just you know, reducing the number of instructions. All right? We also care about the cycles, cycles per instruction because we don't want, you know, we can execute fewer instructions, but if we keep stalling going out to memory because the things we need aren't in, you know, our, our, our L3 cache, then 
then you know, we're not going to get the benefit we, we, we thought we were going to get. So today's class is really about, although we're never going to get this, right, get 99% you know, for instructions, but we can do a pretty good job and get so, somewhere in the middle. So first, I want to talk about the background of today, like why, to help motivate why we want to do uh, code generation or query compilation. And then we'll talk about the, sort of the two main techniques. There's the source-to-source -source compilation, the tra or transpilation. Um, that'll be from an early work before the Hyper 1. I think the Hyper 1 paper talks about it. Uh, basically, how to write C++ code or Rust code, whatever you want, to generate another programming language code. And then you run a traditional compiler on that. And then the Hyper paper you guys read, this is about generating literally like a low-level representation, like the, some IR within your, your database system for the query, and then using something like an embedded compiler like LLVM to compile that. So at a high level, they're, 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 this, at a high level, they're the same. They're still achieving the same thing. Like they're doing code specialization for a query, but there's sort of two different ways to, to approach it. And there's going to be engineering and uh, com compilation cost trade-offs between the, the two approaches. And then we'll go through a quick smattering of a bunch of different systems that are going to do various, you know, these different techniques. Um, and then we'll finish up talking about, uh, we can do a quick Q&A about how things are going with the projects. OK? OK. So the, as, as I already said, the way we're going to be able to reduce the number of instructions we have is through code specialization. And again, the high level idea here is instead of having in our database system these giant switch statements that are going to check to see what the query operator type is, uh, the, the plan operator is, or what the data type is, or what expression you're trying to run in, in your where clause, instead of having these switch statements to iterate over these things to execute the exact piece of code you want, we're literally going to hard code some sequence of instructions that do exactly what the query wants, wants to do. And again, the great thing about SQL and the relational model uh, is because everything's declarative, we know exactly what the data looks like. We know exactly what the SQL query wants to do. So it's not like we can you know, roll the dice and get things wrong. Right, we, can generate, we can look in the catalog and know exactly what we want. And again, in the, in the, something like a parquet file, an org file, even if we've never seen the, the file before, we could look in the header and figure out, you know, is this schema matching up what, what we expect? Uh, and then we could do code specialization based on that. So the, one of the ways we're going to get, in, in addition to maybe hard coding things, another big difference is that there's going to be this, there's the way humans write code uh, that, as I said before, may not be the best way to generate code for, for a, C, a modern CPU. Meaning, like, there's ways to set up code, like using Volcano model as an example, that from an engineering perspective, it's great. It's easy to debug, it's easy to write, it's composable, we can move these operators around and not worry about what, what's below it. Um, but as I said, all that indirection, uh, all that branching is bad for a superscalar CPU. So instead, we can design our code specialization components in our database system to emit code that no human would ever write willingly, uh, but is going to be best you know, when we compile it into machine code for, for the CPU. Right? So if you do a really simple example like this, assume again we're, we're doing the volcano model, we have a three-way join on tables A, B, and C, and you see roughly the query pin like this. So you're scanning, you know, the leaf nodes are scanning, you do some aggregation, you do some filtering, and there's a final join at the top. So again, just assuming that it's the volcano model, the, the implementations of these operators would look roughly like this. Right? You're iterating over, over uh, each, each input tuple from, from your child. You're adding some predicate, and you're pushing things up. And again, whether or not this was vectorized or tuple at a time, you know, for our purposes here, it doesn't matter. So again, but in this case here, think about how you'd actually implement this in C++, C++ code. You would have a pointer to some root node in, in the query plan. And then at runtime, if you assume it's in C++, there'll be a, a virtual function table look up and say, oh, at the very top, I'm doing a join. So let me call it the join operator. Right? And even that, you could have different types of joins. You could, have, uh, you could have an abstract class with a join, and then you have specializations between them. But still, there's going to be function pointer lookups at runtime to figure out what you actually want to do. Right? And that's bad for, again, for our modern CPU. Same thing when we want to compile or run expressions. Right? Assuming we have just the, this where clause in here inside of this nested query, well, that will be represented by some ex abstract expression tree. Um, we have the different operators, and then the inputs are corresponding to the different elements that you're accessing in the query. So the dumbest thing to do to actually run this would be, again, traversing the tree, just walking down, evaluating every single node, looking up on whatever the context uh, that's provided for the query, substituting the values, pushing things up, and then going down the tree around like this. Right? 
So again, this is like would, would be a naive implementation. Some systems actually, actually do this, but again, uh, Postgres is a little bit smarter. Other systems are a little bit smarter, but even, with, even before doing compilation or code specialization. Uh, but this is, this is roughly what you're doing at runtime. Right? The giant switch statements or, or function lookups to go figure out what this is. So, all right, well, this is like, you know, it's a, it's a three-level three, three level tree. Is that really big of a deal? Always think of extremes in databases. If, if I have to do this for a billion tuples as I'm scanning along table B, then this is going to be super expensive to do this over and over again. All right? Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't get too much detail with Postgres. We'll see this in a second. They do JIT compilation now for the where clause. Prior to this, they were using a, a technique called um, direct threading. Think of like it's an interpreter where you have this an array of pointers, and they're calling to that. But even again, because they're doing it on, on a tuple at a time, that, that sucks if you're doing OLAP. Um, and and the JIT will help a little bit for that. All right, so the idea is that, again, we want to specialize code in our database system for anything that's going to be CPU intensive. For anything that we know we're going to be spending most of our time while we run a query, we want to, or even other parts of the system, but for now we assume it's just queries, we want to try to specialize that so that there's no indirection, no lookups to figure out what the type is, what, what the table is, anything like that. It's literally just hard coding as if a human wrote for exactly the, the query plan. So you can do this for access methods, like the scans. Uh, some systems will do this for store procedures. We'll see, see this in the case of Oracle. They'll compile, this, they'll compile a PL SQL UDF into their version of C, like sort of like it's called ProStar C, something like C not here at, at CMU. Like it's a, it's a restricted version of C. Then they'll compile that to machine code. Uh, operator uh, operator execution, like the joins, the the, the aggregations, all that you, you can compile. Predicate evaluation, we just saw how to convert a, a where clause or predicates in, in, inside your, your query and in, convert this expression tree into actual uh, program. And then logging operations, I don't think anybody really does this, but the idea would be if I'm doing like recovery, could I compile the, the interpretation of, of log records? Right, for our class here this semester, we don't care about this because we're not worried about recovery, but uh, some systems uh, can do that as well. So the, the when, when we're actually going to do this, for anything that's going to be focusing on queries, we're going to do code generation or, or code special, specialization when we have the physical plan. So a SQL query shows up. We go through the, the, the parser, go through the binder, go through the, the query optimizer, and then now we have a physical plan. Then we convert that into specialized code, right? Because we want to reason about physical plans and not something more higher level or, or abstract. For other things like store procedures, you, you would do this compilation you know, when they call create function or something, right? So, most systems are going to be doing this, or some variation of predicate evaluation. So we'll see Haiku, we'll see Hyper. They're doing what we'll call holistic query compilation. So they're taking the entire query plan and then specializing that and compiling that. Systems like uh, Postgres, uh, Spark, um, at least older versions of Spark, and um, QuestDB, a couple others, they'll be doing something like this. Because right? the idea is that you have an existing system that is doing interpretation for executing the query plan, but the, the where calls often is the most expensive thing. But then rather than rewriting the entire engine to be now uh, do code generation, you just do code generation for the, for the where clauses. It's a less, of, less of an engineering uh, blast to, to, make, to make that change. I would say also, too, that there's, there's, we're not going to have any security concerns in this for what we're talking about pretty much the entire semester, because I, I don't care about that stuff too much. Um, of course, until they steal my credit card, I care. But, uh, it would be like I don't. We're not worried about like someone doing code injection of like sending us a funky query that we then convert to C code that then can like you know leak out SSH keys or something like that. We're 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 assuming that somebody else has sanitized anything that that we're given, right? So we just we, we ignore all that. If you do care about those things, again, in the case of um, in Hackathon and Microsoft SQL Server and, and and Oracle, right? That's why they convert you to a restricted version of C to prevent you from from doing stupid things. Um, but for, again, we assume that the, that the, the code generation code is written by us, the database system developers, the people building the systems, and that we're not going to do malicious things in our own code. All right, so we, we can ignore all that. All right, so some of this I've already said before. The, way, the, the benefits we're going to get is since we know all the attribute types a priori, we don't have to do anything, again, lookups to figure out what the type actually is. Like we know at like this column, at this offset, it's this type of this size. And furthermore, if it's encoded and compressed a certain way, we know exactly what the compression scheme is. Right? There's no surprises in this because we know everything ahead of time. Likewise, we're, we're going to know uh, all the data types ahead of time, and we can 
try to distill it down to the low level primitives like greater than, less than, equal to, which were their hardware instructions for us to make that run really, really fast. Right? Again, complex data types or uh, user defined types sometimes can be a bit more tricky, but we, we could ignore that. And then we're going to try to avoid any function calls in loops as much as possible. Now we'll see in the case of vector wise and the systems that do the pre, -pre compiled primitives, they are going to have uh, function calls in loops, uh, but they're going to amortize that function call lookup cost or the, the, the jump cost because we're doing it on batches of tuples. Right? If you have to do it for a single tuple, that would suck. But if it's, if it's like, you know, a batch of, a, of, of, of you know, eight tuples or something like that, that's less of an issue. All right, so as I said before, there's basically two ways to do this. And again, at high level, they basically look the same. It's just it's different ways to think about how to generate the code we want to then compile for, for our queries or predicates or what, whatever we're doing. So transpilation is also sometimes called source-to-source -source compilation. And the idea is here that we have code in our database system that can generate other code. And then we would just run a traditional compiler to, uh, to generate the native code, which we, or sorry, the machine code that we then link in and execute as if it was like a you know, shared object or is a shared object in, in our system, right? So oftentimes you'll see like, you'll know, have C++ code that generates C++ code, which you then compile. Amazon Redshift is, is famous for this. And then the paper you guys read in, uh, in, for Hyper, they're gonna do, basically have their own intermediate representation IR where they'll generate some lower level, uh, um, low level implementation of, of the query, then they would compile that into native code. Or in the case of Hyper, we'll see in a second, they actually can interpret it uh, or generate assembly. They do crazy stuff. That, that's in the later version. That's in Umbra. But like, they, they, they don't, you know, they're not taking typical C++ code. They're taking some lower level, uh, low level, lower level rep representation. Again, and we'll see the trade-offs between the, the two of these. So we'll go through transpilation first, and then we'll talk about the hyper JIT compilation next. So the f sort of the first system in the modern era, when I say like the late 2000s, early 2010s, that uh, would, would do code stabilization and query compilation um, is, was this thing called Haiku. And it was an academic system at a University of Edinburgh. And so what they would do is for any query that shows up, they would uh, have C++ code in their system, generate more C++ code, then they would do a fork exec into GCC, which would then compile it into a shared object, and then you would then link that into the database system process. And the way this would work is that you would have to have a, the, the program that you're generating for the query would have to implement a known function with a, uh, a specific signature so that the database system knows how to call into that, to that shared object and, and run the code, right? That's like a, like a standard entry point. Like think of like the main function for any C program without, without obviously calling it main. <clears throat> so the, for this, they were just using an off-the-shelf compiler. I think it was just, just G GCC. Right? They weren't trying to embed anything. This is, this is a precursor to, um, to the LLVM. So what's one big problem with this? Yes? Compilation is slow. Compilation is slow. Why? GCC is slow. Why? No, this is, this is for LLVM. So it's doing a fork exec. So it's running GCC as a separate process. What does GCC do when it starts? Goes read a bunch of config files and see what, see what you know, as if like you're running from the command line, right? It's not really meant to be run. Uh, it wasn't designed to be run like in the critical path of any query or you know, in a database system. It's like a general purpose compiler. So it does a bunch of stuff that a general purpose compiler would do, like go look to see where my libraries are, link those in, parse config files, and figure out what I'm allowed to do, right? And it, of course, it's a fork call. So now I got to talk to the OS, go spawn a new process, and run that on, on the side, right? It's going to GCC is going to allocate memory and do a bunch of stuff, right? So that's going to be one of the big problems with this approach. But we'll see why this actually is, is from an engineering perspective, going to be easier to maintain and debug going forward compared to the LLVM stuff. So the high level looks like this. So say this is that some simple query. And it's like pseudo Python code, right? So for this get tuple operation, if you were doing an interpretive plan, you would first go look what table am I accessing, go look in the catalog to figure out what the schema is. Now, you wouldn't do this on a per tuple basis. You would obviously cache this before outside the for loop, but you have to do it at least once. Then you're going to say, OK, if I, if I want to go get 
the, this tuple within a page or, or the block, what's the offset, I now have to look at the table size, then I gotta return a pointer to the tuple, and then now in this if clause to evaluate the predicate, I'm traversing that, that, that expression tree that I showed before, pulling the values up, checking to see whether things match, uh, and then deciding whether to, to terminate early or, or, or keep going or short circuit things, and then return true or false. And maybe you have to cast things in the right data type as you go along based on, uh, you know, based on what the attributes you're looking at. So again, this is like an overcomplicated, uh, it's a high level, uh, high level explanation of what the query is actually going to do. And maybe again, some of these things you can cash up, at least in this part here. But again, we're doing, if you're doing this on a per tuple basis, it's a bunch of wasted work to do the same thing over and over again. So what Haiku would do is they'll generate sort of stubbed code like this, uh, where you set up some, some, some parameters that are given to you at, at when you invoke this. I think of this like, as a function for the query. And then now within my, my for loop, you know, now I'm not doing, doing any lookups to say what's the size of the tuple or what where offsets are. All that's baked into the code, like literally hard-coded values. Right? And same thing to do the evaluation, same thing. I, you know, the compiler can recognize that some number plus one it can, it, can, it can fold that in and evaluate that once and not repeat it over and over again, right? Yes? So here, the, specifically the predicate is the thing plus one? This question is, like, yeah, this eval predicate is like we, we, we extracted it out and we say, oh, it's plus one, and we hard code that in the program. Is there ever a case where the expression tree is not able to be represented in C++? This question is, is there ever a case where the expression tree cannot be expressed in C++? No. Why wouldn't it? Because like literally, like, yeah, I can't think of anything. Uh, I mean, for in clauses, you can't you probably meet, generate exact. Like, you might be, you may not be able to use a, like, uh, not standard library, but like, like. I, mean, yeah, I think everything you could use at least standard library. Like in clauses or arrays or vectors, so you got to maybe use a SDL library for that. But everything else, you, you can get it down to be those exact instructions. Or again, think of like going back, whatever that query was. Um, I didn't have a query. All right, sorry. The like if the if the expression was uh, where we you know where value equals input parameter plus one, that plus one you don't want to interpret over again since you have the input value like you can bake that into the exact C plus plus code and then now the equal equal sign is just again the double equal sign in, in, in C plus plus, and the compiler knows how to go to town on that and, and optimize that as much as possible. Yeah, the plus one is from a SQL query. Yeah, maybe I, I might have removed the SQL query by accident. Um, yeah, the, the query is like basically select star from, ta select star from table where uh, value, equals predicate, uh, value equals input parameter plus one. And then whether or not the, the, your query optimizer does that, uh, you know, evaluates the, the plus one before it, gives it, before it actually runs it, uh, you know, depends on the optimizer implementation. Yes. This is a weird question, but for systems that use expression uh, compilation, like, do, they, do their optimizers just like not do expression folding and just leave it to the compiler? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a good question. Like, for the systems that do uh, predicate compilation, do they do their query optimizers not do any of this folding stuff ahead of time, and do they just punt and let the the, the, the compiler do that all for you? Uh, for systems that they've retrofitted the the like the compilation after the fact, like I think Postgres does this, like they'll do that because they didn't have the other thing before. But obviously, if you know you're always going to compile stuff, then you can just take advantage of that, as well as additional optimizations that you know the, the uh, you know traditional source code compiler will give you. So what's interesting about the Haiku approach is that the, since it's us as the database system engineer developing the, 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 the code generation piece, we can do anything we want in that. Meaning like we can invoke any other part of, of the system inside of our generated code. Um, so that means like we could call out to the, the network code to send messages if we wanted to. Uh, we, could we could go get you know, data in and out of the buffer pool manager if, if we wanted to could run transactions, right? So we can pretty much do anything we want because it's just, it's as if the, the code was, we're generating was shipped with the database system when, when it was being built by the engineers, right? 
And that means that we don't have to have any specialized bridges to call out to other parts of the system. We just invoke it as if it was a, you know, a function built, built in. And you see this a lot in, um, it's not exactly code specialization, but you see this in a lot of the extensions for Postgres because they're just linking in shared objects. For better or worse, they call all the parts of, of the database system because um, you can, because it's just C code. Of course, you have to manage memory. That's a whole other issue. Um, so the one key advantage, though, even though the compilation is going to be slower, a key advantage of, of the transpilation approach is that debugging is going to be relatively easier, easier relative to the, the JIT compilation from Hyper. Because what are you generating? C++ code. What if it crashes? What do you have? C++ code. You can walk through in a debugger. You have nice stacks traces. You have nice symbols. You can figure out what what broke. Now, you got to do a little extra work to maybe annotate the generated C++ code or C code, whatever you're generating, to reference back what part of the main system generated that code. Because again, I don't, I don't want to debug the, the, the thing I just co-gened. I want to debug the system that generated the code. right? But you can put annotations in there to figure out where this thing came from. So now you just take any you know, off-the-shelf <laughs> C++ programmer, whoever it is, and they know how to use GDB in theory, and they know how to you can then debug your program. You don't really need specialized people that, that are, have to understand LLVM or assembly to make all this work, all right? And that'll be one of the things we see in Redshift. And when we re read the Photon paper later on from, from Databricks, they talk about the, the debugging of a you know, LLVM JIT compiled system is the, 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 the engineering burden is very, very high. And so they, they, they decide to avoid it. All right, so the, I'm going to show some results from the Haiku paper, and they're going to compare it against uh, four other implementations. So the first would be like a generic volcano-style uh, database system that is you know, using generic predicates or you know, expression trees and evaluating them. So this is like, again, the like version zero of, of any database system somebody, somebody builds. Like, think of like BusTub. Then they'll have type-specific iterators using, I think, C++ templates to, to inline as much as possible. Then they'll have a uh, hard-coded implementation, sort of a first pass written by a grad student. Then you have an optimized version written by another grad student. And then you have the, the Haiku code, uh, the, the ones that's generating the, the C++ code. Right? So in this here, the measurement, they actually measured L1 cache misses, but it's so small we're going to ignore that. And it's as you expected, right? The generic implementation, the textbook implementation of the database system is going to be the slowest. But as you go along, as you start adding more optimizations, things are getting better and better. So the, the thing that we really care about is this, this part over here, where the, the, the grad student was able to generate optimized uh, implementations of, like, again, of handwriting the query plans. Uh, this is what? This is TPCH, I think, or this, this join query up here. And it, the, the number, the difference is quite small, but the Haiku system is actually generate, is able to generate C++ code that's better than the, the hand-generated code. Right? Again, and this is because the, you, know, you, you think about it, you're, you're, you only need to build the, the, the code gen piece once, and you can put all the tricks you know how to make the queries run fast within that one implementation. Whereas if you're literally hard coding the queries, you've got to re, you know, optimize every, every single one individually. Right? So the, the, the optimized ones are just going to be faster because there's fewer branch misses. There's, uh, there's allocating less memory. There's, me there's fewer memory jumps in, you know, for functions because everything is almost like inlined. Yes? How do you benchmark these things? How do you know when an L2 cache occurs? It's what? Oh, sorry, how, how do you know when an L2 cache occurs? Oh, how do you, how do you collect this data? Yeah. Oh, I didn't teach you guys about performance counters. Um, basically, the CPU can track all this for you. It's called, CPU, every CPU has what are called performance counters. So they're in the inside, the CPU is maintaining all this information about your programs. And you use a tool like Intel has VTune, the open source implementation called Perf. It's almost like, um, it like uh, if you ever use like Valgrind, but like Valgrind is instrumenting the, the code as it runs. This is like, you don't do any instr instrumentation of the code. The CPU just counts it all for you. And then you can turn on Perf. There's a very little performance overhead. And then dumps out like a, a Perf file that you can then look through and see where the, the cache misses were and so forth. Yeah, uh, actually, who here is familiar with perf? All right, about half. All right, so maybe we can cover that in a week or two, just a crash course on how to do uh, performance debugging. Um, yeah, CPUs are great. CPU can measure all this stuff for you. Um, and again, we can measure down to like L1, but 
cash misses, but we're ignoring that because again, it's, it, it would be way too small. All right, so again, this paper is 13 years old, right? Uh, 14 years now, I think 2008, yeah. To 14 years old. So this is running on a really old CPU that's obviously been, uh, you know, been, been exceeded by everything else, a core two duo. Um, but that that part, I don't. What's that? Sorry, no. It's it's so the exact numbers I don't care about. It's the relative performance difference that matters, right? And even if we had a modern CPU, I would expect that uh, it, it would still look look the same way. All right. So again, as we said, what's the problem with this approach? It's the compilation cost. All right, so, so how much time does that take? So in here, they're comparing the, the, the Haiku generated uh, source code, uh, the compilation cost for either running with O1 or, or O2. And as I said, we don't, we don't ship database system software with O3 compilation because it might put things, it might, might put things out of order and actually end up running slower than, than, than it would in just O2. So O2 is what you want to ship source code with. Obviously, when you use O1, if, like, if you're trying to debug something then you, know, then you run with O1. But obviously, O1 is going to be less aggressive on the, on the optimizations, so that's why the compilation cost is lower. Right? Again, old hardware back in the day, but it just goes to show that, like, the, I mean, first of all, you see a, almost a 3x difference in, in the compilation cost between O0 O and O2. But again, now we're talking, in case in this, for this query here, uh, 600 milliseconds to compile it. Right? And for scale factor one, you can probably run this query in 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds. Um, so this is a big problem because you know, if, you're, if, you're, if your query is only going to run for a, fraction, you know, a, 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 a fraction of the compilation cost, you might have been better off just not running the compilation step at all, and just run the old interpreter version. Now, if your query is going to run for like five hours and it takes 600 milliseconds to compile it, yeah, who cares? But again, the, the disk has gotten faster, the network's gotten faster, CPUs. Not, not as much, but like the, you know, with a well instrumented or well built execution engine, you know, you'll be able to get through. Uh, some queries can finish in, in less than 10 milliseconds, so your compilation cost is, is going to be a big problem. Now, the hyper paper you guys read didn't doesn't solve it. They solve it afterwards. We'll cover that in a second. But in that case, again, because this is a forking GCC, there's it's it's a much more expensive compilation process. Yes. Yeah, the question is, what does Haiku do, or what do people do? In general. Yeah, so the question is, what do people do with the compiled code? Do they just throw it away and discard it, or can they cache it? We'll see Redshift in a second. They cache, they cache it, and they cache everything. And Haiku, I mean, it's an academic system. I, I, I don't know. But you can obviously imagine that, like, um, because if I, if I can parameterize it, potentially, to just put it into, like, you know, as a func and I make it a function where I pass in the, maybe an input value. <coughs> And I don't get maybe the constant folding that, that I would want, but at least now the compilation cost would, would be lessened. And then you essentially end up with what vector-wise is, because that's what, that's what they're doing. But they're pre-compiling everything when you ship the database system, not at runtime for queries. But yeah, caching would help. If it's a prepared statement, you can cache it, because you know you're going to see it over and over again. Right. Is yes? that what Redshift Aqua is, where they're caching all that stuff? Uh, his question is, is that what Redshift Aqua, Aqua is? Yeah. Aqua is a hardware accelerator. That's, which we won't cover that. Even before you get to Aqua, they, 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 they cache things, yes. OK. So as I said, again, the relational operators are a great way to reason about, about queries. Uh, and, 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 and we have these composable query plans. We can move operators down anywhere we want and not worry about what's feeding into what, because it's just sending tuples. Um, but that's going to be problematic when we come time to execute it if we do a, it was, a literal translation of the of like the, the the relational algebra query plan into C++ or whatever you want to compile into, that may not, may not always be the most efficient way to do this. Um, and as I said, we, there was a long compilation cost in, in C++, and in the case of Haiku, they were not supporting full pipelining. They were still processing one tuple at a time uh, from one operator to the next, um, and we you know because it's from 2008. And the vectorization stuff and the other stuff we talked about so far, that came m m much later. All right, so the hyper paper you guys read uh, is not an easy paper to read. I, so hopefully no one spent too much time in the appendix on that LL, the, the IR stuff. I think, I think it said not to read it, right? Um, so what he's going to do in hyper is that, again, rather than generating 
C++ code, they're going to generate LLVM IR directly. And then they would then go ahead and compile that uh, into to machine code. So you end up, again, with the same, uh, you would end up to so the same machine code in theory as the Haiku approach, but you're not going to C++ and then converting that to, to machine code. Or you know, Of course, the GCC is going to put that in, in its own IR. You're just going directly to the IR with, with a bunch of C++ macros that then compose a query plan, hand it off to LLVM, and then LLVM can, can go ahead and compile it. Now, the, the, the challenge of this paper also, too, is because, and he's a genius, he's introducing two key concepts. He's introducing this, this code compilation stuff with LLVM, but he's also introducing the, the push base execution. Um, and yeah, that makes it seem like you can't have one without the other. It's not true. But he's showing you how to uh, can design these, using operator fusion, design these query plans to be very efficient, try to ride query, tuples up in CPU registers for as long as possible. And the push base approach is how you do that. So let's just look at a really simple example. So this is the query we showed before. Um, so we know how to divide up the query plan into pipelines, right? There's a pipeline breaker that says that we can't start executing another pipeline until all the, the, the tuples are processed by the, 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 the child pipeline below it. Now we'll, we'll cover next class how do we take these pipelines and divide them up to task. We run them on different cores and different nodes and schedule them. That's next week. For now, we'll just assume that it's a very simple dependency graph to know. We've got to run run. One and two can run in parallel, but two, three can't run until two finishes, and four can't run until one and three finish. So what Hyper's going to do is that they're going to generate these, uh, essentially, a bunch of nested for loops. Right? It's the push-based model. So, so these nested for loops are going to be able to, within when one pipeline, do as much work you can for a single tuple, and then only go back to the, the next iteration of the for loop once you've done everything you can with that tuple. Right? So you can think of the, the boundaries here are, are, are these pipelines, like this. Right? And at the end, you have this long pipeline for, where you're just iterating over tuple C, probe it into the hash table, probe it into the second hash table, and then emit it when it's done. Right? And so in this case here, for any tuple that that's going to match the join, uh, on the join clauses for, for the other two tables, I'm going to do all that processing uh, up the pipeline before I go back. And I can keep, they're going to be very careful keeping all the, this data in like, the CPU registers themselves. Rather than saying, hey, here's, here's, it's in memory. I hope it makes it. They're actually going to be very careful trying to put it into the registers and not put anything else in there until they have to go back and get another tuple. Right? And you just, again, these are just showing the dependencies uh, between them. So when you compare, so he's, he's going to compare against uh, the initial version of, of Hyper that he wrote, the dude code generation, used, that was like the Haiku approach with C++. And then he had his LLVM-based based approach. Um, but he's also going to compare against Vectorwise, MoneyDB, and Hyper. Again, this is what, 2011, 2010. So these were sort of state-of-the-art uh, OLAP systems at the time. Case of Oracle, they're just showing like here's what happens if you have a, a, a volcano-based system. You know, it's not a column store. It's like the worst case scenario, All right? And I think he calls it DB database X in, in the paper, right? That's because Oracle has in their contract or their license agreement that says you can't name them by name in any academic. Acad What's that? I didn't know it was Oracle. It's Oracle. Yeah. Um, so, but it, again, the paper's ten years old, so who cares, right? Um, Maybe they care. I don't know. Why uh, is it better than MoneyDB and Q5 versus Oracle? This question is why, why, is, why is Oracle better than Q4? Q4? Yeah. Yeah, that one I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that. It should like, never be better, right? Uh, I, it, it could, I mean, it could be the query, the query optimizer. So this MoneyDB at this point was maybe 10 years old. Oracle was 30. 35 years old. So like they've had, you know, millions of dollars poured in the query optimizer, whereas MoneyDB was a small academic team. So it may just be case MoneyDB is picking a bad query plan, but I don't know. We'll see bad query plans later on. Um, so um, right, in the case is here for Q2, I think VectorWise, uh, VectorWise crashed and they didn't get a result. So, so again, I don't care about so much the, the difference between Oracle and everything else. Um, it, the thing we sort of care about is like the the hyper LLM based version and, and everyone else, right? And in the case actually for MoneyDB, it's using it has an interpreter that's going to use opcodes that's going to look a lot like, like SQLite. We'll see in a second. Um, so it isn't just you know it isn't doing function uh, 
It isn't traversing the trees, the query plant trees, the way we said before. It's, it's a little bit better than that. Um, but it's still not, again, it's still not you know, an exact program for the, uh, for the query plan. So the reason why the Hyper one is going to do better than, say, the C++, C++ version of Hyper is that they're going to do more aggressive pipelining to try to ride tuples up in CPU registers because they have low-level control of what art was goes in those registers uh, because they're generating the IR, whereas in C++, you're hoping the compiler can figure that out for you, and it doesn't always do that. Whereas in the LLVM stuff, you can have exact, uh, exact control. In the case of Q1, it's just a where clause uh, and an aggregate. There's no joins. Um, and the, the where clause is simple enough, but it's, again, the riding things up that, that single pipeline as far as possible is why they're going to get better performance here. All right? So again, compared to other systems, you know, this is pretty significant. But again, this is measured in milliseconds. It's, it's it's, you know, it's over 10 years old at this point. Um, scale factor one is only one gigabyte, so it's not that big. Uh, but you can kind of see how like, we're getting to almost the, bone, the bare bones of like, how much better you can actually get in these systems. Yes, the data is going to get bigger, but like, in, if you have to process more data, you know, there's not, you know, there, there, there isn't 0100 that's going to make the extra number instruction to get the XQ go away. So code specialization is going to get us to almost the like, like bare metal speeds. Um, so these, these results are pretty good. So to measure now the compilation cost, this is not in, I don't, this wasn't in the paper you guys read, and this is not like a true scientific evaluation of these two approaches because I'm taking the numbers from the, 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 the Haiku paper and the numbers from the, the Hyper paper, which again, were for running on different hardware at the time. But again, it's, it's, you can kind of see roughly the performance difference uh, between the two systems, right? So again, Haiku is doing translation, so it's generating C++ code, invoking GCC, taking the shared object, linking that in, and running it. Uh, whereas in the LLVM, Hyper in the LLVM, it's all in the same address space. A separate thread runs the compilation stop. Uh, and you can, you, know, you can initialize LLVM when the system starts up, and you don't have to re reinitialize, it, reinitialize it over and over again. Um, and so you, you see the compilation times are getting down into you know, un under 20 milliseconds, which is not great, but it's, 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 it's acceptable. Yes? Between Haiku and Hyper? Yeah, is Hyper still faster after Hyper? That's that's this. So oh. Hyper C++ is an approximation of, of, of Haiku. Oh, okay. Right? Um, it's actually better than Haiku because I still think this is, uh, I mean, it's still tuple at a time, but I think he's, he's still doing the push-based model in this, I think. Right? Um, in the case of vector-wise, you know, they're doing pre-compiled primitives. But it is, it is actually doing vectorized execution. Now, I, I don't know whether they're doing SIMD on this. Again, 2011, 2012, maybe AVX2 or something like that. But um, there's other factors as well. Like, uh, so it's not, it's not always, as I was saying before, it's not always going to be a true apple apples comparison because like, the way Hyper does fixed point decimals for Q1 is really efficient versus like, uh, I think vectorized at the time was doing something similar to like Postgres. Right? In the case of Hyper, it's literally a 128-bit number. They just rip through instructions with that. We don't have to do any lookups or do casting of you know, var charts to figure out what the decimal point is. So like, you know, this difference between this isn't entirely just because it's doing compilation. But I would say for these, it's the same data types. So these, it's a good, good difference of the two approaches. OK. So as I said uh, multiple times today, the, the big problem is going to be the compilation time. Um, if you can do it ahead of time before the query runs, fantastic. But you know, oftentimes in an OLAP system, you've never seen the query before. I think maybe the, that exact query. So you got to go, go ahead and compile it. And in the case of Hyper, they observed that the, the compilation time of a query is going to grow super linearly relative to the complexity of the query. So not so much how much data you're accessing. It's like what is in, it, what is in the actual query, like the number of joins, the aggregations, the predicates, the where calls, the, and so forth, right? So for OLTP, not that big of a deal because most applications will be running almost the exact same queries over and over again, maybe just parameterized, and the data systems can automatically convert them to prepared statements. So we can compile it once and reuse it. OLAP queries, as I said, if, if we've never seen the query before, then this is going to be a problem. And so the, I don't think, again, I don't think this is in the paper, but the, the, one of the examples that they told me was 
after Hyper got acquired by Tableau, uh, they had to make it Postgres compatible, right? Because it was shipped in, in the Tableau product as like a, a query accelerator. And what would happen is people would, would you know, install Hyper, and the very first thing they would do is hook up PG Admin to it, which is like a, a graphical interface, a web interface to Postgres databases. You, you can see all your tables, you can write queries and so forth, right? And so when you turn on PG Admin, the very first thing it does to figure out what tables you have is it does queries against the catalog to figure out I have these tables of this type and so forth, right? And so with just regular PG Admin pointing it to regular Postgres database, uh, you know, queries it would, it would, it would start up instantaneously. But in case of Hyper, because it had to do all this compilation stuff, it would be like a 20 second pause for these, again, tuples, queries that aren't grabbing a lot of data, but just had a bunch of complex joins against the, the Postgres catalog. And the system, the, the again, the administrative interface would pause for 20 seconds, right? So it looked like the, you know, everything was unresponsive. 20 seconds doesn't seem like a lot, does not seem like a lot, but again, if you're used to having instantaneous access to your Postgres database through PG Admin, you know, something's wrong. So then they came out with another approach, a follow-up to the paper you guys read in 2018, uh, using a technique called adaptive execution. <coughs> and the idea here is that they're still gonna do the same thing in the paper you guys read, where they generate the LLVM IR, but then instead of you know, not running the query until you finish the compilation step, they're going to have this interpreter that they wrote start interpreting the LLVM IR, run, start running the query right away. Then in the background, then, then they're going to run the LLVM compiler to compile that IR into to machine code. And then if the compilation finishes before the query finishes, then they just slide in the shared object uh, and you know, replace the interpreter and the query then run super fast after that. All right? And we'll see in the paper you guys read next class, the Morsels paper, there's this natural boundary between the, t the query task, or the, the plan task, where you, know, you, you process some, some chunk of data, uh, the, the, the worker thread processes some chunk of data, and then when it's done, it says, oh, is the next thing we're going to do for the same query? And when it does retrieves that task, it can go look up to see, is the compiled version of that task ready for me? And if it is, and then it just slides in. So it's not like you're, you're interpreting and then you cut it off you know, middle, of, middle of a for loop. There's, again, when I'm done running my batch, I go get the next thing, and I may be pulling a, a compiled version of that task rather than the interpreted version, right? So all this is done, done seamlessly. So the, the overview diagram here is going to show numbers that they reported in, in their paper. Um, so this is going to show walk through how this all works. So the SQL query shows up. You run it through the query optimizer. For them, that takes roughly 0 0.2 milliseconds. Hyper also has one of the state-of-the-art query optimizers. Uh, we'll cover that later. But you know, that, that's a pretty good you know, optimization time. Then they'll take the physical query plan, they'll run it through the code generator that's going to generate the LLM IR, and that takes roughly 0 0.7 milliseconds. Right? So this, this is pretty trivial to, to do this. You're, you're, measure, you're measuring microseconds. All right, so now at this point, there'll be uh, uh, three different branches. And these can run in parallel. Um, so the first thing is that you take this LLM IR generated here, and then you're going to run your own bytecode compiler uh, that can then generate some, some, convert the IR to your own bytecode, and then they have an interpreter that they wrote that, that, that compiles this, right? Um, I think they told me they, all of this they wrote themselves. There were, there were open source LLVM IR interpreters, but Thomas didn't like any of them, so he wrote, wrote his own in two weeks. Um, uh, to, we did, we got, we, we imported our own German here, uh, <laughs> well, he was a visiting master. We got our own German, and it took him about a semester to write the, the same thing, right? So it, it's not impossible. It can be done. And you don't, you don't actually have to implement your own, your, all your, you don't have to implement all the LLM IR, right? You just need whatever your, you know, whatever this thing's going to generate, right? Can, and you control the whole stack, so you can, you can do this. All right, so then in the background, they're going to also take this LLM IR, and they'll just run the, the regular LLM compiler. Think of like this, running this 01, or sorry, 0, and that's going to generate some x86 code. Uh, and when that's available, we can, we can slide that in. So the bytecode compiled up there takes you know, 0 0.4 milliseconds. Say this one takes 6 milliseconds. So if the query is still running after 6 milliseconds, then, then you, you can slide that in. And then if, if this thing is really taking much longer, then you can kick off the more expensive uh, compilation steps, like running o, O2, and that takes 25 milliseconds. And then you do just optimizations, run that, the optimized version of the compiler, and then you have more executable code there. Right? So, Yes? Isn't bytecode just x86? Uh, no, think of like uh, JVM bytecode. It's some, uh, some uh, you know, it could just be LLM IR. In our system, we did L directly LLM IR. For I, th I think they wrote their own. Uh, 
right? Um, but I, but again, I, I don't think it's like it's it's not doing like the heavyweight compilation like hoisting and stuff like that like GCC or Clang would do, right? Um, so the there's a lot of you know a couple of benefits of this. Obviously the speed, right? Because if my query is really simple, then this thing might be enough, right? And this is basically what 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 SQLite does, right? They have their own VM that interprets these opcodes. But if the query is going to run longer, then you know if I have to wait six milliseconds to get an, you know machine code for this, that's again that's that's a trivial amount of time. Um, the other benefit though is that you're you now can actually uh, debug you know, failed programs more easily because you have this thing at the top. You have this, this interpreter for your, for your bytecodes. So if, you're, if you run the compiled version and it crashes, you can then reverse that and figure out, OK, what lines of the code generated that, that those opcodes or whatever that failed, or the, the machine code that failed for me. And then I can s step through it with a regular debugger at the top and walk through and figure out, OK, here's what, uh, you know, what line of code am I tripping up on. Yes? Correct, yes. The statement is, am I saying that if your query is short, is the bytecode compiler going to be better than doing anything down here? Or, or like not doing any fancy stuff and just see if it's going to be It's not C++. It's, 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 it's opcodes. It's like, like, G, like the JVM opcodes. Right. Right? But we're doing JIT here, right? right. So yeah, like the JIT. The, like th this is the JIT step. Uh, what kind of code? Machine code or C++ code? What are you saying? Yeah, like run, run buffer. Like don't do any of the rest. Like what, how does bytecode compare to just like not doing any code generation at all? Oh, his question, your question is how does, like if I did this and don't do any code generation, uh, sorry, sorry. If, I, if I just have like a, a bus tub interpreted cell system, I don't do that versus having this step. Is this step always going to be better? Well, I mean, for like maybe really, really, really simple queries, select one, maybe. But like when things are run, running, you know, like more complex things, then I want this, absolutely. But like you think of like, I can this will handle the short things without going through this expensive step. Uh, but then when the, when the, the bigger queries, more complex things show up, bus is going to choke, this thing's going to rip through it. So it can handle both. His question is, can I switch to the, from the bytecode to x86 code on the fly? Yes. Think of like, my, I, have the, I, I take a query plan, I break it up into pipelines, and I'll have different instances of those pipelines running, like a task instance, or, um, and each one's going to process 1,000 tuples. So I'm running, my, you know, my, my thread's running this bytecode version of it. <coughs> I process 1,000 tuples. When I'm done, I go check to say, hey, is the compiled version ready for me? If it is, then I just slide that in and process the next 1,000 tuples. And the logic is exactly the same. So it's not like there's going to be like, any difference in the data that's generated, the results generated from the bytecode version versus the compiled version. It's all the same. Yes? Could the optimizer guess about how complex the query would be and then choose some of the branches instead of having to execute all three in parallel all the time? Yeah, her question is, uh, can, we be, can the optimizer be smart enough here and recognize, oh, well, this query is select one. I know I don't need to you know, read any data or do anything expensive, so just skip all this. Yes. How, but when you do a, start doing joins, and we'll see this in a few weeks, the optimizer is going to be way off. So like, a simple threshold might be uh, like do this. Always, you always have to do this, and then maybe just always do this in the background, but then maybe some trigger says, OK, after 20 milliseconds, that's enough. Let me run this too. Right. Yes. So can I say that on the average case, it's like building on his point. Can I say on the average case it might be worse, but on the worst case it will be really good? His statement is, can I say that on the average case it might be worse, uh, but on the, uh, on the worst cases it'll be, it'll be better? <coughs> yes. But where that, where that cutoff between, like, on the, like, in that best case, like, is the, is the interpreted system going to be better than, than, than compilation? It, it depends on the hardware. It depends on what you're doing, right? Um, yes? How many, like, for what sort of, uh, let's say, company would these, like, the difference in milliseconds actually matter? 
Oh, his question is for what kind of companies would, would milliseconds matter? No, like for, like for, for one query. For, for one query. One query, yeah. Like the, let's say the difference is 20 milliseconds. Right? Yeah, so his question yeah, is like, why do, why do people care? Yeah. So all right, in the, in the, on the extreme case are the high frequency trading guys, yeah. right? Those guys are like they're, they're snorting cocaine, they're running their own fiber under the, the river. Like those guys, they want to be, they want to measure queries in microseconds. But is this an OLAP? Like this is for specifically OLAP or for, for both OLAP and OLAP? Because this could be, you could use this for both, okay. right? But like so, so the high frequency trading guys care a lot, right? right. For for us mortals, the um, <laughs> the conventional wisdom is, is 50, 50 milliseconds. And that's usually for like a transaction. And that number comes from uh, internet advertising auctions. So like when you go visit a web page and you're not using ad blocker, uh, you know, the, the, the hosting company sends, or wh whoever's running the ad, say it's Google, they send a, a request out to the different uh, advertising brokers, the auction houses, to say, here's this user visiting this web page and here's everything they know about you. You know, they bundle that up into the request. And I think you then, the contract is you have to respond in 50 milliseconds what your bid is for the for turning the ad. It might have gone down to like 40, 30 milliseconds, but that's roughly what it is. So the response time you have to get back is, is 50 milliseconds. So, so now, assuming round trip time, so maybe it's, it's some, some number less than that. So you gotta run a query to go look up and see whether I wanna sell an ad to this person uh, within, within that time. There's another number too, I think it's from Amazon, it says for every 100 milliseconds that the, the Amazon product page is slower, they lose like a million dollars. Like it's some, I mean, I, I, I don't know that, that, if that's apocryphal, but it's, there's some correlation between like slower pages equals less sales. Okay. Yes? I was saying just to add to this, you think that this query would be a small part of a big system, right? So like, if this has more latency, then other people get less time to play with. So everyone has to optimize as much as they can. Yes. I've never met anybody who says, yeah, my, my query runs slower. Yeah, yeah, great. Right? <laughs> no, if, and certainly there, there's, a, there's a cost element to it, right? You can pay you know millions and millions of dollars to get that microsecond you know sub microsecond or sub millisecond latency. Most people don't need that. Where the right trade off it depends. But like uh, like everybody would benefit from this, I think. Okay. So in terms of the performance gain you can get from these different queries, again, so you have the the three different phases: the bytecode version, the unoptimized LLVM, and the optimized LLVM. And again, you can see how the, the you know, this, is, this is log scale, but you know, there's a pretty big jump between the, 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 the bytecode version and the, and the, the, the sort of simple LLVM pass one. Um, and then depending on the, the complexity of the query, the gap between the you know, this O0 and O2 between the divergence will be slightly different, right? Again, scale factor one, this one, all the queries are running a single thread for the queries, right? So you can use the other, the other threads to compile do, do the compilation stuff, All right? Again, but it's not just about performance, it's also the debuggability and the maintenance of, of the system. All right, so I wanna do a quick, like, uh, sort of quick run through of a bunch of different systems that are doing, again, different variations of, of code co compilation or query generation, co code generation or query compilation. Um, and I sort of broken up loosely into four categories. This is not scientific definitions, it's just what, what I, how I think uh, an easy way to categorize and understand things. So the translation would be source to source stuff we talked at the beginning with Haiku. The custom one will be, although actually Hyper should be over here, but on the other side. But these will be different systems are doing different things. Sometimes they're using LLVM, sometimes they're not. Um, or, or the CLR if it's in if it's in Microsoft stuff. Then there's a bunch of Java databases that are doing you know, just in time compilation with JVM. And then here's all the ones that are using LLVM. And then, then the skull and bones are means these, these systems are dead. So you know. We've killed two at CMU. Um, not proud of it, but it happened. Um, all right. So the very first system that did code, code specialization was one of the first relational database systems. And as oftentimes in databases, IBM did it first, right? So the very first you know, relational database, well, this, <coughs> the, the first major relational database system they were building, there was a, there was a precursor to a system R uh, out of the UK called Peter, Peter Lee Relational Test Vehicle, which sounds like a prog rock band. Um, but that was like a prototype, and, and a bunch of people that built that one then went to go build System R. But System R was the first real one. Um, so back in the 70s, they, they had an early you know, implementation of code specialization or uh, code generation for, for running queries. Again, think of like the 1970s, the hardware was terrible, 
right? The CPUs were slow, disk was slow, everything was terrible. So if you had to then interpret the query plan on this really slow single-threaded CPU, that would just, you know, it would take forever. So what they would do is they would have, after the query came out of the optimizer, they would then cogen uh, IBM System 370 assembly and have then the uh, assembler put that together and run that as, as for the query plan, right? And it's sort of putting together a bunch of code templates to you know, do scans, to do joins, and so forth. Yes? What was the coaching cost, like the compilation cost? I, this is the 70s. I, I have no idea. Right. Right. It must have been high then as well, right? It's quite a statement. It must have been high then. Uh, yes, except like they, um, well, the, if you have, if, if, the function calls were always expensive because the CPU sucked. It was the, most of the engineering reason was, was why they abandoned this. Um, so they built this in System R. Um, Again, the way they think about System R was it was a groundbreaking project. Ingress was being built at Berkeley at the same time. Oracle came a little bit later in the 70s. But in System R, they got a bunch of like eight people that all just brand new PhDs in like mathematics and CS. They took Ted Cod's paper and then tried to actually build it. So they had one person, you know, uh, one, one woman built the query optimizer, the first like cost-based query optimizer. Uh, two other people went off and built, you know, designed SQL. And like one dude built nothing but this, this code generation step, right? And so when they, when they, when they when the system R project ended, they did take some bits and pieces out of, out of the code base and, and put it into the, the two commercial relational data systems that IBM was building, SQL DS and DB2. But one thing, they didn't carry over any of this code gen stuff, right? And in this, there's this retrospective paper from, I think came out in 81. So at that point, system R was, was eight or nine years old. Uh, and they talk about how they, they decided to then do this, this code generation stuff in the early version of System R. But the problem was every time, since it was like a brand new system, everything was always in, in flux. Anytime like an API change in one part of the system, then you then, that would break the code generation step and you had to go then rewrite all, all of that. So it just came, came too much of an engineering overhead to just change this thing over and over again. Plus then you had to have to deal with like engineers when, it, when, when a query plan failed because of some bug in the code generation code. You had no way, easy way to link that back to what was the, again, this is all assembly, what was the assembly code that, that generated that. Um, so again, when they built, when they, when IBM went off and built the new systems, they threw that away. Yes. Why did that not deter the Germans? Uh, the correct statement is why did not that not deter the Germans? Because they wrote their own debugger. We'll get that in a second. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, wh what inspired them to want to do this? My understanding from the paper was that most of the advantages of this come uh, with OLAP queries, where the disk overhead is less important, and more so the bottleneck. So, so like what, what possessed them, I guess, to say, like, okay, we really need query compilation now in the 70s? Uh, well, first of all, like, there were no other relational systems built at the time. So it's not like, you know, there was any, uh, you could look at, the, oh, they did it this way, we'll, we'll just follow them. They, they were literally inventing this, right? And again, you're all used to, like, cell phones and, like, everything being super fast. This was terrible in the 70s, right? Like, your cell phone is, is like, you know, hundreds of times more powerful than what they had back in the day. So the, everything's super, super slow. If you then have to do literally like lookups, say, okay, like, you know, uh, interpret the query plan, look at the types and, and, and switch and something, <coughs> the queries run forever. So they're, they're kind of like trying to make do with, with the hardware that they had at the time. Mm. So I, I, I think it's a perfectly pl plausible approach why they did this. It's just, again, it, it's hard to maintain. All right. Um, Vector-wise, we've, we've, we've keep mentioning this over and again, but I, I want to bring this up. So. Again, what they're going to do is they're not going to compile queries or, or primitives on the fly. Uh, sorry, they're not going to do code generation on the fly. Instead, they're going to pre-generate all possible combinations of anything you would want to do on data uh, and query plans for any possible data type ahead of time. So think of like hundreds of integral, integral functions to do things like for a, a vector of integer, in 32 integers, you know, here's the less than version, here's the greater than version, here's the greater than equal to version. They're going to pre-generate I think, you know, using a bunch of scripts, all these functions. And then they compile all that, when they, and then we ship the binary, and then, and then your data system binary just has them all in there, right? And then at runtime, your query shows up, you look at the query plan, you know, okay, well, it's a you know, 32 column running against a less than some constant. Here's the, the pre-compile primitive that I want to use for that. And then you just basically make now an array of function pointers to, to generate the pipelines for, for the queries. And as I said before, uh, uh, jumps to functions are bad for modern CPUs, but if you're passing on these batches or vectors of tuples, then that function call, uh, jump cost is, is amortized, right? 
So it basically looks like this. So say you have some query like this, and then you have a simple uh, filter. You have a string column equals ABC and int column uh, e equals four. So then it, you would literally have a you know, some kind of pseudocode thing like this that that is is in your source code that you then compile, uh, and you would have one for the for the string, one one for the integer, and then at runtime, oops, sorry, at runtime you're literally calling these one after another and passing the vectors along, and then you can maintain you know the offset vectors the, the, of like here's the here's the tuples that actually match. Now, you wouldn't allocate the memory inside the function like I'm doing here, but like you know you would pass this along. Uh, and keep track of like, okay, what tuples actually match, and then you all the SIMD stuff we talked about before, deciding whether you know you want to keep processing, re refilling, or, or make changes. There, I don't think they shipped it in the commercial version, but there's a paper. I don't think, am I citing it? Let's see. Yeah, this micro identity paper. They have a paper where they 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 would take all their primitives and run all different possible compilers on them, ICC, GCC, Clang, with a bunch of different parameters on them. And then at runtime, they would run basically like an optimization program to figure out like uh, which one is going to perform the best for you know for, for some you know for the CPU that they're running on. So they could switch out what implementation or sorry what machine code implementation or comp compiled version of the primitive at runtime. But again, I, I don't think that ever went into the commercial version. All right, so Redshift is going to do the haiku approach of of query compilation. I think actually the Amazon then hired the the Haiku guy from Edinburgh. I think he was there for a while. Um, so what they're going to do, they're going to convert query plan fragments into templated C++ code. Um, and they'll be doing push-based execution with vectorization. Um, and then since the compilation cost of like forking GCC is so expensive, they're going to cache everything. And not only are they going to cache for whatever your database is for all your queries, they're going to maintain this giant global cache for any query that anyone's ever ran on any database running on Redshift. So this is this is amazing because this is a completely different way to think about how to do query optimization or code generation, right? In the case of Hyper and and Postgres and all the other systems, like they're starting cold every single time. They you know it's like you, you turn the system on, you start putting data in it, and you start running queries. It has to you know warm up its own local cache to figure out how to code generate that and compile it and so forth. So Amazon basically says, well, instead of us code genning or, or all these primitives ahead of time, let's just take queries as they show up. Generate the the simplest code for them, cache that, and then as new queries show up, we see whether we have an existing uh, compiled version of that plan fragment for that query, uh, and, and, then we, and then we just use that. So the, I think the paper they say the hit rate for the global cache of every single Redshift database in all of Amazon is like 99.95 percent. So no matter what query shows up, you know 99.95 percent of, of the fragments are going to be in the global cache. For your local cache, the hit rate's like 85%, but then you can go fetch things from, from the global cache, right? And again, this is, in, the you know, in the cloud, it's a completely different way of thinking about how to uh, optimize things because you, you can see everything. And you can, you can share information across different customers. Now, when you think about it, the, 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 the C++ code they're generating doesn't have any proprietary information where you could leak things from one customer to the next, right? Again, going back to the primitive stuff in vector-wise, it's a you know you have a, in, a column of integers you want to do a less than on some constant. It doesn't matter whether it's your database which has like banking information or my database that has, I don't know, a blog blog you know application. At the end of the day, it's just ripping over in, integer or integer columns with with constants. So there's no issues reusing those those caches, those those cache compiled query plans, All right? They do have to do a little extra work. Where like every time the version of the system changes, similar to the problem that that system R had. Where they have to maintain compatibility, but in the cases where it breaks its compatibility, they just have like a background service that, that just pre-warms the cache. So they have all the C++ code they generated before, and then when a new version comes out, see whether it breaks, and if not, maybe recompile it to the new version to just fix it automatically. All right? Yes. Is fetching from the global cache is faster than compiling the global cache? His question is: Is fetching it from the global cache faster than compiling yourself? Yeah, it's a network call. It's way faster than 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 you know, running these on GCC, right? And again, you get the same benefit. Like now, when things crash, you can go. You have C++ code, and you can you can debug that. All right. So Oracle, as far as I know, does not do any uh, query compilation or predicate compilation. Uh, I bring them up because they do something interesting. As I said, where they'll take store procedures uh, that are written in PL SQL, which is like PLPG SQL. It's like the 
it looks like ADA. It's it's the um, it's the SQL standard of how, how you write UDFs. We'll cover UDFs later in the semester, but they take those PL SQL UDFs or store procedures and they they transpile them into Pro Star C, which is their internal version of C, uh, and then they go ahead and compile that native code. And because the the C dialect is restricted, you're not worried about them like you know, jumping to some arbitrary locations in memory and trashing the database systems. You can run this as a shared object directly. Um, we're not going to talk about new hardware, but like back in the day, in the previous decade, after Oracle bought Sun Microsystems, Sun was shipping the Spark CPUs, which I don't think exists anymore, but they started putting like database, database operations inside the silicon itself, like for compression and, and security and other stuff like that. So like, this is even better than code generation, right? This is literally, there's an instruction that it does exactly what your database system does. Um, but, and it was only for Oracle stuff. But again, they, they don't sell that anymore. So Hecaton is not an OLAP system. It's, it's a transactional engine. Um, but this is what they were doing. They were compiling both the store procedures and SQL. Um, and they would compile it using, I think, into C code, which they would then link into with the, the CLR, which is uh, Microsoft's version of, of like the JVM. Um, and as I said before, like. In this case here, they do have a bunch of checks to make sure that somebody doesn't try to do like buffer overflow stuff in, in, in the C code that's generated. Um, I don't know if, if other systems actually do this or not. Um, but what was cool about this also too is, as I said, the, since everything is just linked as a shared object, you can have the, the generated code invoke other parts of the system. So in the case of where, where you can think of Hecaton as like a, like, a, like a storage engine for SQL Server, so the same with like MySQL, you can put in RocksDB, you can put in InnoDB. Hackathon was like something you could put into SQL Server. So then the generated code could then talk, talk to other parts of, of SQL Server that maybe weren't the running on Hackathon. And again, you can do this because everything, everything's linked together. All right, so SQLite is the most widely deployed database system in the world. And most people don't know this, but they're doing some variation of code generation. So they're going to convert your query plan into uh, this, these op codes for this this virtual machine that they designed, or the, the one guy designed. Um, and then at runtime, again, they're just going to literally interpret, the, the VM's going to interpret those opcodes as if it was like the JVM, right? So if you ever use SQLite, if you run explain, you don't get the, you don't get a query plan tree like you would normally in, in any other database system. You get this, you know, this, 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 this list of opcodes and instructions uh, with nice little comments to tell you what, what it's actually doing. Um, if you have to get, if you want to get the actual query plan tree itself, you have to get a call explain plan and then, and then the SQL statement. So the reason why they, he did this is because um, they want to run on any possible hardware, right? Embedded devices, cell phones, you know, laptops, any, any kind of ISA. Um, they're certified to run on airplanes. So your airplane is actually is running SQLite. There's satellites in space running SQLite. And so when you want to port the database system to a, a new, new platform, a new, new environment, Instead of having to modify all other parts of the system, you just, have to, you just have to modify the VM. And he has test cases to make sure that like, this actually works. So you don't care about what actually generated the opcodes. That's always going to be the same from one architecture to the next. I mean, there's file system stuff you have to deal with and, and so forth. But the, it's, it's vanilla C++ code that, or actually, it might be in C. Yeah, it's, it's vanilla C code that's not doing a lot of specialized stuff. All the specialized stuff would be in, in, the, in the VM here. We asked him once too, also like, could you actually, uh, could, you, could you build like an FPGA to actually interpret these opcodes? And he says it changes from one version to the next, so it probably wouldn't work. Okay, so the Hyper was the earlier version that, uh, of a system that the Germans built. Um, after it got bought by Tableau, uh, the, you know, Tableau owned the source code, so that went away. So then Thomas went, started building a new system called Umbra. We'll talk a little bit about, about that again throughout the semester. Um, but what's amazing about Umbra is that rather than, than generate the IR, uh, the LLM IR, the way that, that they did in Hyper, um, he's instead going to generate an IR that then gets converted into assembly directly. So it's a bunch of these C++ macros can take the IR and generate x86 assembly. I think he supports ARM as well, right? And then now you have this assembly. You can then run, instead of the bytecode interpreter, or by code compiler, you just run an assembler, which is even faster, because it's literally translating the, the assembly instructions into, into machine code without any additional optimization passes. So then they do the same thing we talked about before, where they, take the, you know, they run the query on the assembled version, 
Then in the background, they do the more extensive compilation, and then when things are available, they, they slide it right in. So they have a follow-up work called uh, a number called Flying Start. It came out two years ago. I debated whether to read this paper versus the, the paper you guys read before. Uh, the, the, you know, the paper you guys read before, it's the seminal one, but you know, it's, it's, it's a bit dated now, and this is probably the better way to do this, or it is the better way to do this if you're going to go down this path. But another way to think about this is like they basically built their own compiler in the database system, as well as the database system itself, right? Who does that? Germans, it's insane, right? Then, as I was saying before, you still have the problem where if a query crashes, you are living in assembly world where you don't have any provenance about what generated that code. So then they wrote their own debugger hooks for RR. They have a whole other paper on this uh, that is explicitly designed for taking crash query plans or trying to debug query plans that are generated using this code generation technique and linking it back and walking through the, the, the query while it's running and showing it at the exact same time, like here's the, the code lines that generated it, right? So the papers call it on, an, on another level, which I think I said to them. I was like, this on another level. Um, and then they put it as the title of the paper, right? And I, can, I can share this. There's a video they showed me. It was, it's insane, right? All right, so again, Redshift doesn't do, you have to do any of this because they have the giant query cache of every possible query plan as before. In the, you know, in, in the single node approach, you don't have that. And then this is probably the better way to do this. All right, so quickly I want to talk about Java databases because um, it's, it's, it's very much similar to the LLM stuff we talked about before. It's, at a high level, it's doing the same thing. But instead of generating LLM IR, you're generating J JVM bytecode. And then you let the JVM hotspot compiler, or whatever it's called now, just compile that to machine code if, if it decides to. The one I want to bring up, the two I want to bring up is Spark and QuestDB. And so the reason I'm going to bring up the Spark one is because, as I said, they're going to abandon any code generation query compilation stuff uh, in the newer version, Photon. And, but this is a precursor to do this. And in the paper you guys read, they'll talk about how the things I was saying where if you're doing code generation, you have to have people that really know compilers and know like low-level assembly and, and, and bytecode stuff in order to, to optimize things. Where if you, just, uh, if you just build a vectorized engine in C++, there's a larger number of people that actually can work on those things. And they found that even though this may actually run faster in the short run, in the long term, you can have more people try to optimize your... your you know, the vector-wise code that you have, and you end up getting better results and, and better uh, maintainability of the system. So what they would do in, 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 in 2015, they, they introduced this new tungsten engine where they would convert the where clause expression trees into uh, abstract syntax trees written in Scala. And then they would just hand that off to the JVM. JVM would then convert that into bytecode, and then you invoke it as a function and do that natively. We'll see also, too, in the paper you, you guys read, they'll talk about how, in some cases, really complex queries, this AST would get massive, and the JVM would choke on it and say, this is too big, I can't, I can't run this query, or I can't compile it for you. And then they have to fall back to the interpreted engine. And if you switch over to, um, if you switch over to a you know, vector-wise approach, you don't have this problem. Another Java-based database that, uh, that does code generation is this thing called QuestDB. And so it's a time series uh, columnar database out of the UK. It actually, this is actually written by former HFT guys uh, who you know, knew how to optimize Java code, and they decided to build a database system. Um, so what happens is the query shows up. They just compile the where clauses, um, but they're going to generate an IR in Java code that use ASM JIT, which is think, think of like, the, like sort of like a lightweight version of the LLVM, then compile that into machine code and, and run that. And so this is from a blog article they wrote where they show two optimizations that they made. They, they converted the system to be multi-threaded from single-threaded and go from, from a JIT system to a non-JIT system. So the original version was single-threaded with no JIT. And for some query here, it takes 30, 30, uh, 30 seconds. But then if you do JITting, you, you shave off about 10x. You get it down to 3.5x. But then if you turn on multi-threading and no JIT, you're actually doing even better than with the JIT. But then the combination of the two of them, you, know, you, 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 get, you get the best result. For, for me, this is curious that like the first thing they did was, in, you know, they 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 built the JIT part first, right? So the so the JIT came first, then they did multi-threaded like a year later, and to to me that seems surprising because the first thing I would just do was obviously build, uh, you know, parallel queries. Um, I don't know why they did that. What was the case? But uh, 
In my opinion, you should do multi-threading first, and then if you want to do JIT, do, do JIT second. And then, because this result clearly shows the, the difference. The combination of two of them can make a difference. All right, we're way over time. Um, let me see if there's anything else I want to quickly show. Um, yeah, maybe uh, we, we'll cut it off here, and we can pick up a little bit of this on, on next class. Because we want, we want to talk about the project as well. Um, but I didn't get to talk about single star. I'll bring this up next class. But the single star approach is the, probably the better way to, if you do, you do JIT compilation. It basically, it's like it's like the um, it's like the hyper approach where you with the, the the with this interpreter, and then you they can compile it, and then you can have an additional meter step that that allows programmers to work through and figure out what's going on if there's a, if there's a failure, and then the flying start one is amazing, but you have to be German to, to to actually build that kind of stuff, and nobody else does what what they're doing, generating assembly, which is insane. Um, all the newer systems though are going to for the most part going to choose to do a vector-wise style approach. Again, for the reasons we'll see in the, in the Photon paper from Databricks, OK? All right, so next class, we'll do query task scheduling. Maybe I'll cover some more some, some of the compilation stuff that we missed. Um, and then the paper you guys are reading is from the Germans again. This will be morsels. Even though it's going to be on a single node, the idea of how you break up the, the query plan tasks into these, these morsels based on the data, that's going to be the sort of key idea we want to build in, in our system.